Hi, everyone. Thanks for tuning in today and joining us for another Wednesday webinar. As you know, we are having these to bring information to you that we think is very useful in terms of helping you cope with the consequences and effects of the pandemic crisis that we're all living through right now. I'm delighted today to be talking about health insurance with an expert. Olivia Hoppe is a research analyst for the Center for Health Insurance Reform at Georgetown University. And she'll be our presenter today talking about health insurance and all of its ramifications as this is something that many of our members have asked us about and uh, expressed concern about with what's going on. So Olivia, let me turn it over to you and we'll get started. Thank you. Great, thanks so much, Tom. And thank you guys for um, having me today. I'm gonna start off with a uh, PowerPoint for you all um, to sort of walk through the basics of health insurance and how it might be affected by uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, again, uh, as Tom said, I am Olivia Hoppe from the um, Center on Health Insurance Reforms. And we are a, um, we're based in the Georgetown University's Health Policy Institute. It's a multidisciplinary group of faculty and staff, and we're dedicated to conducting research on issues related to health policy and health services. So we, pr we provide policy expertise and technical assistance to federal and state policymakers, regulators, stakeholders, um, and consumers on various private health insurance policy topics. Um, we do this through different vehicles. Primar primarily, we publish reports, we publish studies, and in-depth blog posts. Um, we share these with members of the media, state and federal policymakers, as well as advocates and consumer organizations. For example, you'll see on the slide that we have our cheer blog, where we house all of our research. Um, and then we also have a comprehensive center on surprise medical bills, and, and I'll get uh, a little bit more into that topic later on. Um, and then uh, we post nonpartisan research policy ideas and the practice of, of that uh, balanced billing issue. And then we also have a navigator resource guide, which is a collection of hundreds of frequently asked questions and consumer resources to help guide assisters and consumers through private health insurance. So um, on the last slide, uh, I've linked to this um, site that we have to help you guys, um, you know, if you have any other questions after, after um, this webinar. So um, we'll start off with ways that you previously got insurance or didn't. So um, most people um, under 65 get their insurance through their employer or their partner's employer. Um, and then uh, a good mar uh, segment of the market will get it through the marketplace. That's healthcare.gov or your state-based marketplaces. Um, there's, a, I, there's 12 right now that have their own websites. And then um, you can get insurance through an insurer directly. I'll, I'll refer to that as off-marketplace plans. These are plans regulated by the ACA, but um, primarily for people who um, make too much money to get those premium tax credits on the ACA. Um, and then there's non-ACA compliant health plans. These are short-term plans, hospital-only plans, and um, I'll talk about those uh, toward the end of, um, end of the PowerPoint. And then uh, many people get their insurance through Medicaid, Medicare, TRICARE, the VA, and other state and federal programs. And then um, there's a, a large chunk of America that's uninsured, right? So perhaps, um, perhaps you forewent insurance due to affordability or, um, or uh, lack of ne uh, necessity, all right? And so right now we're in an unprecedented time in healthcare, um, coronavirus. Um, Definitely a crisis for um, health and health insurance. Um, the loss of employer insurance, um, you might be losing your health insurance due to loss of employer coverage from loss of hours, loss of the job, or the employer's inability to afford premiums anymore because of lack of in the business. Um, premiums uh, for your current health insurance might be too high now um, versus the income you're bringing in. And then, um, and for those who are uninsured, maybe you're worried now about your current coverage or um, lack thereof due to contracting, uh, the risk of contracting coronavirus um, or having other medical needs during financial struggle. All right, and so I'll go over quickly some uh, programs that are available. That's uh, primarily a lot of people. Um, I wanted to go over Medicaid first because right now if you've lost your job and your income Monthly right now is at zero. This is sort of your first stop. Um, many states in uh, the US expanded Medicaid, right? So these um, light blue states that I've colored in on the map, um, all of these states have expanded Medicaid. Um, so anyone with an income up to 138 of the federal poverty level, um, and I'll go over that chart in just a second so you can sort of see some examples. Um, 
And Medicaid is assessed on your monthly modified adjust adjusted gross income. So that's your household income, um, and that's based on your tax households, right? So if you're a tax filer, it's you and all of your um, tax dependents, right? So um, not your overall revenue, but your income that you're um, basing your taxes on. And then um, there are some other rules that apply for non-filers, non-filer but um, assuming that most people um, watching this are filers, um, there's some information on the last slide for resources on that. All right, and then, um, so Medicaid eligibility, these are for expansion states. Um, so up to 138% of the federal poverty level, you can see by household size up to four. Um, there are charts that you can sort of go upwards of that and, um, and uh, estimate uh, whether or not you're uh, below the 138 line. So um, right now, if you're in an expansion state, um, any of those light blue colored states, um, you can apply for Medicaid if you right now you are not making a lot of money and that should be your first stop. It's comprehensive insurance um, and it's uh, usually free for people. Uh, it's, it's no premium. So uh, Medicaid programs in non-expansion states are not based on income alone. So these dark the red the states that are colored in dark red um these states did not expand medicaid so um that's usually based on if you uh, are applying to that you need to have low income and meet um different criteria so uh your residence meaning in the state that you're applying for your immigration status and um this sort of categorical eligibility which uh, usually is sort of a blindness a disability or a chronic illness that uh, makes you eligible for medicaid in that state along with the other criteria um, but again the light blue states um, if you are having no income i can't stress this enough if you don't have income coming in it's uh really important that you just apply for medicaid that's um that's definitely a silver lining in all of this that there is a safety net in those states for you guys um, residents in states that have not expanded Medicaid are at risk of falling into what we call the Medicaid gap. Um, those, and that means uh, those who make too much to qualify for uh, premium tax credits or help from the federal government um, on uh, through the ACA. Um, and their states have limited Medicaid programs, so they don't qualify for those either. So you can see this graphic from the Kaiser Family Foundation. There are people um, who have very low income and they meet all those criteria, the categorical eligibility um, uh, characteristics. And then um, there's people who have no coverage and that's the Medicaid gap where you make too much to um, get Medicaid in your limited uh, Medicaid program in your state, and then, um, but you make too little. So uh, to get uh, marketplace subsidies, you have to be over 100% of the federal poverty level. So if right now your income is zero, um, we will get to that for those people who are in, um, in uh, non-expansion states as well, because there are some options for you. So uh, quickly, I wanted to touch on um, ineligibility for Medicaid due to immigration status. So. Um, documented immigrants are typically subject to a five-year waiting period for Medicaid eligibility. Um, those immigrants uh, that are subject to that um, are still eligible for premium tax credits even when their income falls over 100% of the federal poverty level. So those who are on work visas or um, have green cards and things like that, um, you are still eligible for premium tax credits even if you um, technically would fall in that uh, Medicaid gap in those non-expansion states. All right, and so marketplace insurance. This is for um, especially those uh, in my previous slide, those non-expansion states. Um, this is going to become very important or for people who are still bringing in income, but their income is uh, much lower than uh, what it was before coronavirus. So um, those with incomes between 100% and 400% of the federal poverty level are eligible for premium tax credits to lower the cost of their monthly premium. These are subsidies provided um, by the federal government, and um, you can choose to take them monthly and lower your um, premiums on a monthly basis, or you can uh, move the credit to the end of the year and sort of uh, get it on your tax return or save on, your, uh, on what you owe in your taxes. Um, the, and then those between um, 100 and 250% of the federal poverty level are eligible for um, additional cost sharing reduction subsidies to help lower deductibles and co-insurance. So um, in this income uh, bracket, you'll see um, additional help, right? So let's say 
you make 150% of federal poverty level, um, you'll see your premiums will be um, lower due to the tax credits, and then you'll also see deductibles go down, right? If it's a if it's a $3,000 deductible, you might see a deductible of zero or $100 um, to help you a little more on that. Um, and then open enrollment, unfortunately, has ended in December for most states, but you might be eligible for a special enrollment period. Um, 11 states and DC created a special um, coronavirus specific special enrollment period. So it doesn't matter if you were uninsured, it doesn't matter how you got your insurance. Um, in those uh, 11 states and DC, you can absolutely sign up for insurance. Um, there's in every one of those states, I believe right now. Um, the states colored in dark red are on the federal marketplace platform. That's um, healthcare.gov. So um, that's controlled by the administration, the federal administration, and they've declined to um, have one of these coronavirus special enrollment periods, but there are still other ways to get a special enrollment period and, and uh, losing job insurance is one of those. Um, Idaho is colored in yellow because they have their own state platform, but they also declined to have a special enrollment period for coronavirus. All right, so other special enrollment periods. We have um, a change in your household. That means if you've uh, gotten married or had a kid or um, adopted a child, um, this special enrollment period is last 60 days after the change. So um, if, you know, about two months after most of these changes, you can get um, insurance on the, on the marketplace. Um, a change in residence. So this is um, your legal domicile, right? So um, it's all based on your tax information. So if you're somewhere, um, this does not count for short-term moves for um, healthcare. It doesn't count for uh, staying at someone's place for a month or two months. Um, but if you expect to be there, uh, I believe it's six months out of the year or more, um, then that um, is technically, uh, you can say that you've changed your um, residence. And then um, loss of insurance. And this is um, loss of minimum essential coverage insurance. So this is um, not those short-term plans. If you have a short-term plan or um, sort of a, a non-marketplace plan, then, um, then you don't qualify for a loss of insurance. But if you've lost your employer coverage or you've lost um, uh, sort of minimum essential coverage, if your insurance has decided to um, not provide in your in your area or something like that, then you do um, qualify for a special enrollment period for 60 days after the before or after the change. So if you know that you're losing your job in a month, you can um, go onto the marketplace and apply for a special enrollment period and sort of tell them, you know, I'm, I'm losing it on, I'm losing my coverage on this date and then you won't have to have a gap in coverage. Um, a change in immigration status. So if you go from a, a working visa to a green card or something like that, or green card to citizenship, then um, you do open a special enrollment period um, for 60 days after the change is made. Um, and then becoming newly eligible for premium tax credits. So if you, and this is, you have to be already enrolled in a marketplace plan. So even if you're enrolled in a minimum essential coverage plan that's off marketplace, you bought it directly through your insurer, um, this does not make you eligible um, for a special enrollment period if you can no longer afford that plan um, on healthcare.gov. Um, those states that have the special, enroll, uh, the special enrollment period exactly for coronavirus, that, that covers everyone. If you need to apply for um, premium tax credits, you can. But for the states on healthcare.gov, um, you need to be uh, have your income under zero, uh, under 100%, and then if you get an income that's over 100%, you are now newly eligible for um, premium tax credits and CSR, so you can um, go into a special enrollment period. And those who are perhaps 300%, 400% federal poverty level, and you've already had a plan on healthcare.gov, you can apply for a special enrollment period with an income change, and um, and uh, you will get a special enrollment period for that to adjust your premium tax credits. So these coronavirus specific special enrollment periods for anyone who wants to um, apply, especially those who are uninsured, um, these are the lengths of the SEPs. This is all current as of yesterday. So um, all of these special enrollment periods are still open. The one that's ending the soonest is Vermont so far, April 17th. Um, um, I'm not, or in Connecticut, I'm not sure if they're going to extend it past that. So um, any one of these, you can apply until midnight um, to try to, uh, on uh, these final days to um, enroll in health coverage and uh, apply for those premium tax credits. 
Um, and again, I'm just showing you these uh, tax credit eligibility. So 100 to 400% federal poverty level, again, um, based on your um, tax household and your annual, annual um, MAGI income, which is the uh, modified adjusted income. All right, and then, um, and I wanna quickly go over projecting your household income in a non-expansion state, right? So this is the states that have the Medicaid gap that I mentioned earlier. Um, you definitely want to project your income. This isn't based on what you made last year, this is what you expect to make this year, right? So um, premium tax credits are calculated based on your projected annual income. That's for the whole year of 2020. So um, when we're thinking about that, I mean, um, and I, I I want to make sure that I'm clear on this. If you're in a state that has expanded Medicaid and you are not making um, an income that puts you over that 100% of federal poverty level on a monthly basis, then you should apply to Medicaid. But if you're in a state that has not expanded Medicaid um, and you're not making much every month um, and that puts you below 100% monthly, then we want to really pay attention to how we project our income for 2020, the year of 2020. You wanna think about the income you already made from January until March. So let's say you typically made um, $2,000 a month. So you wanna say, okay, well, January through March, maybe I made $6,000 um, for those months and then, I and then I lost income. So then you wanna calculate whether or not you're making uninsurance, uh, uh, so uh, unemployment insurance benefits, excuse me. Um, and then you wanna calculate um, what you'll be making from that, and you wanna include that additional $600 a week that was um, approved in the CARES Act stimulus package. So um, for Medicaid purposes, that $600 is not included in your income. Um, so even if you start making unemployment, um, that additional $600 will not kick you off of Medicaid. Um, you'll be on Medicaid for the, for the remainder of this um, coronavirus unless you start making other income through your um, through your job. Um, but for the marketplace, they are including the additional $600 a week as income. So your unemployment benefits from your state and then the extra $600 a week, you would want to sort of calculate that. And that will uh, more than likely for most people get you over that 100% um, of the federal poverty line to get you some uh, premium tax credits. And then you want to sort of look at, okay, well maybe I start returning to work in June or July and you wanna calculate what you might expect to make between um, that date that you think you might start working in December 31st, 2020. And then you wanna take that overall sum and divide it by 12 because, um, and you sort of want to say that that's your monthly income, even though right now you're making, uh, let's say $500 or $0 in April. Um, for those states that have not expanded Medicaid on the healthcare.gov application, um, just because of how it works in the system, you wanna make sure that you put a monthly uh, income that equals that that annual sum that you estimated just now. So, um, and that way it doesn't sort of, it could give you a, if you put zero in a month, it could sort of refer you to a Medicaid agency that will decline you anyway. And it's just a, it takes a long time and things like that. So, um, so you sort of want to divide that sum by 12 and put that as your monthly income for the year. And, um, and for most people, this should get you over that 100% of federal poverty level and um, give you access to um, those tax credits. All right, so um, quickly going over the cost sharing reduction eligibility, that's 100% of the 250% poverty level. Um, and I also want to go over um, some important income information. All um, premium tax credits must be reconciled at the end of the year. So if you're taking um, healthcare.gov, it gives you the option to apply it to your monthly premium that lowers your monthly premium right now, every month um, while you're receiving these credits. Um, or you can take it as a credit at the end of the year. But at, no matter what, when you're filing your taxes, you have to reconcile these credits. So if you underestimate your income um, and do not update your application, you may have to pay back a portion of the premium tax credits you received when you filed your taxes. So um, this is super important, um, especially right now. I know it's really hard to estimate your income for the whole year because you're not sure when you might get back to work and get those, um, get those gigs again. Um, but it's really important to be um, conservative, but not take too much of a risk, right? You want to um, make sure that you are as close to what you estimate to make, so that way you don't, you're not on the hook to pay that money back, right? Um, the cost sharing reductions, if you um, underestimate your income for those, you don't have to pay the cost sharing reduction, the amount of the cost sharing reduction subsidies you've gotten back. It's only the premium tax credits. 
So let's say you um, estimated that you'll be right now at 150% of the federal poverty level. Um, and then at the end of the year, um, let's say you got back to work and you ended up making a lot of money. And at the end of the year, you're actually at 300% of the federal poverty level. Then, um, and if you have not updated your application throughout that time to say that uh, you've had a change in uh, household income, then you'll have to pay back that, um, <clears throat> that middle number of uh, what's left over between 150% and 300% of, of whatever they gave you in um, premium tax credits, which um, can be a hefty bill. So um, make sure that you are, as your income changes, you wanna definitely update you that application. You can update it um, within 30 days of any income change and adjust your um, premium tax credits as, um, as you go there. And then um, I wanna go over the CARES Act stimulus package again. I wanna make sure that this is very clear to everyone. There is a one-time $1,200 per adult, $500 per child tax rebate um, that is being sent to most Americans, um, those who make under $75,000 as an individual and $150 as a couple. Um, and sort of phasing out um, as you get higher in income. These payments are not considered taxable income. So you do not have to include that when you are estimating your income for premium tax credits, and it will not affect your ability um, to be eligible for Medicaid. Um, the extra $600 per week in addition to existing unemployment insurance benefits between March 31st and July 31st, 2020, these are um, considered taxable income. So at the end of the year, when you're um, looking at what income you made throughout the year, um, this will be included in that. So uh, there was a, a note in the legislation that said any additional unemployment benefit is disregarded in the assessment for Medicaid and CHIP eligibility. So um, those of you who have children who are going to be going into the Children's Health Insurance Program, uh, CHIP, or those of you going into Medicaid, um, the additional $600 a week will not um, disqualify you um, from your eligibility for Medicaid. But um, as I said before, that, um, that additional unemployment benefit is included in the application for premium tax credits on the marketplace. Um, so it's, uh, it's, a, it's a bit of a confusing uh, <laughs> uh, unique situation there, but, um, but it's important to know when you're estimating your income for the year. Um, all right, and then we get on to losing your job insurance. A lot of people who have um, job-based insurance, um, if you leave your job or you've been um, laid off or furloughed, um, the insurer must provide you, and, and that most of the time being your employer, um, must provide you with um, and your spouse if they are already covered, an election notice informing you of your rights to continue coverage within 14 days of being notified to plan administrator or human resources that you're leaving your job. So um, in that, it doesn't mean that your um, premiums are going to stay the same as you're used to when, um, when you had that job-based insurance. So um, an issue here is that the insurer can require you to pay 100% of the premium cost plus a 2% administration fee. And um, just to give you an idea of what that might look like, in 2019, the average job-based insurance, um, health insurance plan, had an average premium of $20,576. That's an annual premium. So, um, and that's according to the Kaiser Family Foundation. So um, if you look at that, that's, uh, probably a lot higher than people are used to paying monthly for their job-based insurance. So um, so for those of you who are saying, oh my gosh, that's way too much money, do I have to do that? No, you don't. Um, the offer of COBRA does not disqualify you for applying for those PTCs on the marketplace. If your income is low enough to get premium tax credits or cost-sharing reduction subsidies, then uh, you can absolutely forego your COBRA coverage and apply for um, health insurance on the marketplace. Um, if you do enroll in COBRA, though, you are not um, able to subsequently say, okay, well, you know, I thought I wanted this, but it's a little too expensive for me, or I don't, I don't like it anymore. I'd rather enroll in the marketplace. Um, you're unable to um, decide to enroll in the marketplace without obtaining that um, special enrollment period. And, and for COBRA, it means exhausting that COBRA coverage. Um, if you decide that, or, or if it is just unaffordable for you, but you've already enrolled, um, you do not get a special enrollment period um, for not paying those premiums and losing the coverage that way. All right, and uh, a lot of people are probably wondering, okay, well, what the heck is COBRA and, and what's the pro and what's the con um, for me uh, enrolling in this kind of plan? So um, the pros, um, employer-based plans offer uh, a greater choice of providers. They often have um, 
preferred, provi preferred provider organizations. Um, those are PPOs. Those are um, usually most providers take those types of plans and marketplace plans. There's almost no state that has a PPO on the marketplace. So you're looking at EPOs and HMOs. Those are closed networks that have, um, you know, usually have to have a primary care doctor and then get referrals. And um, it's, a, it's usually a small network of doctors or a smaller network of doctors, depending on where you live. Um, another uh, benefit is for those undergoing treatment or managing a chronic condition, COBRA allows continuity of providers, right? If you're having um, medical treatment that is chronic and it's going over a long period of time or getting any sort of cancer care, the COBRA plan allows you to stay with those doctors and stay with your treatment um, with the same plan that you're used to for, um, for the length of your um, COBRA coverage. And then um, any out-of-pocket spending will continue to count towards your deductible. So if you're already, if you've had high instances of uh, medical needs uh, since January and you've paid a ton towards your deductible, if you enroll in that COBRA coverage, you're not starting off at a new deductible. You're still paying toward that same deductible you have. Whereas if you go to a marketplace plan, you're starting over with a brand new deductible. Um, the cons of COBRA can be, um, it's cost prohibitive, right? That $20,000 is um, not something people are used to paying annually for health insurance, especially if you're getting it through your employer. Um, so if you're eligible for a financial assistance on the marketplace plan, the affordability, um, you know, there's a big difference between COBRA and marketplace plan affordability. Um, if you're generally ineligible for a special enrollment period after accepting COBRA benefits, so um, if, like I said before, if COBRA becomes too expensive, that does not mean um, you're eligible for a special enrollment period to apply for those premium tax credits. Um, you'll have to wait until November 1st. Um, and then losing COBRA coverage due to failure to pay premium, as I said, will not qualify you for a special enrollment period. That's just really important to remember when you're um, deciding whether or not to enroll in COBRA. So then there's small em employer health insurance options. I know many people um, listening to this are small employers. So um, just a reminder that there's no requirement for small employers to offer health insurance. Um, small employers with one to 25 employees may be eligible um, for small employer tax credits through, through the small employer health options program known as SHOP um, if you meet certain uh, criteria. And that's listed on the last slide in our resource for SHOP. Um, this, Tax credit, I don't think a lot of people um, know a lot about. So if, uh, if you fit those criteria, it might be a really good option to you. Um, the small group market usually has lower um, premiums, right? So you might be able to get a, a more comprehensive plan for a lower cost um, if you're willing to um, provide insurance to some employees. Um, in most states, to qualify for a group plan, you have to have, uh, if you have only one employee, they cannot be your spouse or child. There are some states that allow sole proprietors to obtain a health plan. Um, for example, Virginia has a special rule for sole proprietors, um, and there are some health plans in various states that will allow a group of one or um, a group of one and a spouse to enroll in a group plan, but um, it's best to um, contact your state's Department of Insurance or a reputable insurance broker, and um, you can find reputable insurance brokers through your state Department of Insurance um, for that information. And then employers may enroll in a shop marketplace um, directly from an insurer or through an agent or broker. Um, shop programs vary from state to state, so you want to contact um, local shop approved brokers for assistance in small employer health insurance. So um, I, uh, my best advice would, to go to, uh, were, would be to go to your state department of insurance and try to find some shop um, approved brokers that are reputable and registered with your department of insurance. Um, and lastly, um, I want to quickly go over these alternative health coverage products um, with a sort of a buyer beware. Um, the only way to know 100% that you are buying an ACA compliant comprehensive plan is to buy it through your federal or state marketplace. That's healthcare.gov. Um, for DC, DC Health Link, um, every, uh, the state-based marketplaces are all listed on healthcare.gov and you can get to their websites right from there. Um, there are a lot of websites that um, offer 
skimpy uh, plans and uh, they have quick sales and they want to call you and and a lot of them have pretty websites and they have websites that mimic gov government uh, websites. So be sure to double check that you're in the right place when you're looking for it. Um, your marketplace will not cold call your phone and their phone numbers do not change. So any marketplace that you're dealing with has one phone number, it's listed on their website and they will not call you and try to sell you health insurance coverage. That's just not going to happen. So if you're seeing that, you're um, being called by a different um, website. And a lot of times those are selling um, these um, alternative coverage options, short-term plans, healthcare sharing ministries, indemnity plans. And um, these are not major medical insurance and do not have the same requirements and regulations as ACA compliant health plans. They um, may serve their purpose um, and you may think that this is the best option for you and that's up to you. But um, it's really important to know the risks that you're taking by um, enrolling in one of these plans. Um, they often exclude pre-existing conditions, which could range from asthma to um, an ankle injury five years ago. Um, so it's important to know, um, uh, to read the fine print and try to get your su uh, summary of benefits coverage when you are uh, thinking about enrolling in one of those. Um, and if you believe that you have been fraudulently sold health coverage, if you... Um, you know, maybe you had a little bit of a panic when COVID-19 hit. You said, okay, I'm uninsured, and you Googled health insurance, you went on one of these websites, and now you're saying, oh, crap. Um, you can contact your State Department of Insurance and, and report them if you believe that you've been fraudulently sold health coverage. Um, well, and thank you guys so much. I'm looking forward to the questions and answering um, whatever I can for this. Um, and you can email me, tweet me, um, all of that stuff. Well, thank you, Livy. That was very comprehensive and I appreciate you for doing the presentation. I did want to mention that I put a survey link in the chat box and that's intended to give ASMP information about your current situation in terms of the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic and also to give us ideas about what you're looking for in terms of more information either topics or potential guests that you think you would recommend to us that we consider as presenters going forward. So I appreciate it if you would take advantage of that link and utilize that for your uh, purposes. And so I want to open it up to some questions and I know we're monitoring questions from different, uh, different platforms at the moment. So, okay, I've got one from Twitter uh, and that is, is there any service out there that can help us understand the language and the policies to determine whether or not it is legitimate based on your last point, Olivia? Sure, yeah, so um, there, to know that um, it's, min the phrase we wanna use here is minimum essential coverage. So if you think that you're being sold insurance and you're like, okay, is this, you know, I'm wondering what this is. Um, you can ask the person who's selling it to you, is this minimum essential coverage according to the Affordable Care Act? Can you give me a, su a summary of benefits and coverage that explain my benefits? And in there, um, if they can provide you with a summary of benefits coverage, with, which all ACA compliant plans will, um, that will tell you that it's um, regulated by the ACA and, and follows all of those rules. And um, our navigator resource guide, um, the last slide, I believe you guys are posting this uh, PowerPoint online, right? Yes, we are. Um, so um, the last slide on that, after the thank you slide, has a list of really good resources. And on, um, on that list is our navigator resource guide. So on there, it'll tell you a lot about these alternative plans and um, how to make sure that you're buying an ACA compliant plan, um, sort of walk you through the um, specifics. Also, um, healthcare.gov, as well as all the state-based marketplaces have assisters, navigators. I'm a certified application counselor for healthcare.gov, so um, we provide free, unbiased information um, to people who are looking to um, purchase health insurance or, or learn more about health insurance and know, you know, what's a deductible, what's coinsurance. So um, there's find local help on healthcare.gov. You can type in your zip code and find people who are local to you that's brokers and navigators. Um, if they're called a navigator or an assister, those um, are always free and always unbiased. They're not um, uh, funded by insurance programs or anything like that to sell you a certain kind of insurance. They're just there to give you information and they will only sell you um, plans approved by the Affordable Care Act. So here's another question, Olivia. What kind of health questions should I expect from an insurance company when 
we're discussing the applicability of a new plan or their criteria for them? Sure, yeah, and that's a great question. So all the plans that are minimum central coverage um, under the ACA are not allowed to ask you any questions. So that is a big uh, red flag, right? If you know, if you realize you're on the wrong site, you'll realize you're on that wrong site because they're asking questions about your health. Um, the ACA um, banned that. They said um, no more asking about pre-existing conditions, no more asking about your health. The only thing that um, you could be charged more for under the ACA is smoking, um, as well as, um, age. So your premium may be based on, um, on your age. And that's, I believe it's, uh, it can only be charged more up to three times depending on your age. So, um, so yeah, so if they're asking about a knee injury or the last hospitalization you had, your insurance, um, through the ACA will not ask you those questions, but, um, short-term plans, healthcare sharing ministries, hospital only plans, um, they are not regulated by the ACA and they absolutely will ask you those questions and um, may, um, they sort of underwrite you, right? So, um, so what happens is you might say, okay, well, I had an ankle injury in X date or, um, or when they get a hold of your medical records, they'll sort of see those. Then uh, a lot of them have look back periods of five years, three years, um, or more. So they might uh, underwrite you, which means they say, okay, well, because you have asthma or because you have a knee injury, we might still insure you, but we will not insure anything related to those things, right? So if you have asthma and you get a pulmonary embolism, that will not be covered because it has to do with your lungs and you have had a history of asthma or you got an inhaler one time. Um, so the, that's sort of a uh, flags to look out for. But if you're getting um, ACA insurance or Medicaid, no worries, you won't be asked those questions. So one of the things that you said earlier had to do with the special enrollment period. Mm -hmm. And the thing that, you know, I wanted everybody to know who's listening is that I have just uh, written letters to the leaders of the Senate and the House regarding the sec what I hope will be another round of stimulus. And in that I specifically addressed health care. And one of the things that I asked for in that section of my letter, which will be posted on the website later on today, is the idea that that the, there should be a special enrollment period for COVID mandated by Congress nationwide, rather than just leaving it to the several states who have made that decision to expand it. What are what's the problem that gets in the way of that? which seems to me to be a very logical response to the pandemic crisis that we're in. Why, why wouldn't all states be willing to open up a special enrollment period, or at least sure. the ones that have, you know, have marketplace solutions in place now? Mm -hmm. Sure. So um, every state-based marketplace um, that has their own uh, website, they don't use the federal platform. Um, all of those states, except for Idaho, um, have put out a coronavirus-specific special enrollment period. Those are the only states that are able, like state-based marketplaces that have their own platform. They are the only states that are able to decide on their own without approval from Congress or the Trump administration to, um, to implement these special enrollment periods. Um, those states that are on healthcare.gov, even states that um, are implementing state-based marketplaces but still use the um, healthcare.gov platform for enrollment, that's uh, states like New Jersey, um, I call Oregon, uh, states that are sort of moving towards state-based marketplaces but not yet using their own platform. Um, these states rely on the federal government to make those decisions. Um, and that can happen at an administration level. It does not need legislation. They can implement a special enrollment period through um, the Centers on Medicare and Medicaid Services, which um, oversees the um, federal platform. Um, and those are uh, the reason they have not implemented a special enrollment period is um, uh, it's, uh, it's definitely political. There's um, rhetoric about, um, you know, not being in support of uh, anything Obamacare, right? Anything Affordable Care Act. So, um, so there's a court case going on right now that the Trump administration um, is a backer of, right? They support this um, Texas v. ACA uh, or Texas v. Azar um, court case that is trying to um, repeal the ACA altogether. Um, it's going through the courts right now. I, 
I, I don't want anyone to panic about it. Um, the ACA is absolutely the uh, law of the land, but it does play into politics, right? So, um, so um, President Trump announced that he is not interested in um, opening a special enrollment period, but that does not mean we can't hold him accountable, right? So um, I encourage um, anyone who cares about this to call their congressperson and say, you know, um, I was on, you know, if you're, if you're affected by this, you know, if you were uninsured um, before coronavirus, this is who it's going to affect. If you were uninsured um, before coronavirus hit um, and you um, think that you need insurance now in states that are on the healthcare.gov platform, um, you know, you've got really limited ability to have, um, to have eligibility for a special enrollment period without, um, without an emergency one, you know, during um, natural disasters, they usually open up some sort of special enrollment period for those natural disasters. And, um, and there's an argument that this is, this is one. So one of the things that I just want to emphasize again, and then we're going to get to some more questions is the idea that we are act actively lobbying on your behalf to try to ensure that nothing is done to gut or harm the basic over you know, structure of Affordable Care Act, and we'll continue to do that. And I'm making it very clear that in the same way, the states that have opted not to avail themselves of Medicaid expansion, that that's a problem. And I've mm -hmm. let um, you know, members of Congress know about both of those issues and we'll continue to um, do that. So we have some more questions now coming in from an ASMP member. Can you explain the difference between co-payments, deductibles, and co-insurance? How do they mesh together as part of an insurance plan? Absolutely. Sure. So um, every insurance plan has um, a deductible and that ranges. Um, the ACA makes um, an annual deductible cap at um, a a little over, um, I believe, a little over eight thousand dollars right now, maybe eighty one hundred dollars. Um, that's your cap, right? But your insurance plan has discretion over what they're going to charge as a deductible. So your deductible is basically, um, let's see. So um, everyone has car insurance. I think it's really easy to sort of explain this, um, the deductible portion through car insurance. So um, when you have car insurance. If you get into an accident, you have to pay sort of that lump sum of money before you're able to get your insurance to kick in, right? Um, let's say your deductible is $500, you have a fender bender, and no matter what the cost is of the repairs, you have to pay that $500 first. They're not gonna give you your $30 rental before your $500 is paid. So um, in insurance, it works similarly. So um, let's say um, you have an insurance plan that says you have a $1,000 deductible, um, and this can also be um, separated from your medical deductible and your prescription deductible. There are certain plans that combine them, certain plans that keep them separate. Um, but basically, you have to pay toward your deductible in order to have other um, benefits kick in. But with the Affordable Care Act, any plan that's regulated under the Affordable Care Act, if you get it through COBRA, through your employer, through the marketplace, um, those uh, include 10 essential health benefits, right? So you get one exam per year, your checkup, your annual checkup um, is absolutely covered um, for free. Um, and for women, your, um, your uh, wellness checkup uh, through your, um, through your OBGYN is also um, free. Um, other than that, um, so yeah, you sort of have to pay off this deductible depending on uh, what your insurance is. Um, and then there's also co-payments. So uh, co-payments and co-insurance are basically um, a, a way to sort of, after deductible, pay for your health services, right? So some insurance companies will say, okay, for a primary care doctor, your uh, co-payment is $20 and for a specialist, it's $40, right? Or 20% co-insurance. Um, so that's sort of when you look at the bill for your primary care doctor, if you have a co-payment of $20, every time you go to the doctor beside that free annual visit is going to be $20. Um, and then for co-insurance, let's say you have a 20% co-insurance for your primary care doctor, then that bill that the doctor is going to send you, whatever um, they charge insurance, you're going to pay 20% of that um, insurance bill. Does, it, does that sort of cover it? It does, it does. Uh, another question that's come in is, if my insurance company denies coverage for a service, is there anything I can do about it? 
Sure, yeah, depending. Um, you want to look at your summary of benefits and coverage. Um, if you have employer insurance, you can ask HR for that. Um, or if you have your own plan, you can sort of, uh, through healthcare.gov, you can go in and check your uh, summary of benefits and coverage, or you can ask your insurance to provide it, your insurer to provide it to you. Um, that will sort of go over um, your networks. If, um, if they have tiered networks, or if you're in an HMO plan and you did go out of network, um, there's limited options for you, right? Because um, you went to an out of network uh, provider. Um, there are certain states that are, um, and this is where balanced billing comes into it. So balanced billing is basically when you go, you do your due diligence, right? You research the hospital, you research the provider and you make an appointment and it's in network. It's, you know, you're supposed to be covered by insurance. And then maybe the anesthesiologist or the surgical assistant is, um, is not um, covered by your insurance and you didn't have the ability to choose that provider. They just were um, uh, taking care of you or perhaps you uh, rode an ambulance to um, the hospital when you call 911 and that ambulance isn't covered under your insurance. There are certain states that um, have enacted laws, um, surprise billing laws, and, um, and I can provide a, a link to states that have enacted uh, certain laws and what they cover, but um, sort of, limiting the insurer and the provider's ability to bill you for those out-of-network providers and services that um, you had no choice over. But not all states have done that. You can always appeal to your insurer and you can um, report things to your department of insurance um, and, uh, and to uh, most departments of insurance have consumer advocates. Um, you can go there and um, try to appeal to them and say, you know, um, if it's something like that, or you can look at the essential health benefits. So for example, if your insurer says, no, we don't cover the flu shot, they cover the flu shot. You, you should appeal. If they're uh, regulated by the ACA, you can appeal that. And, and these questions can also be found on the Navigator Resource Guide as well. And so here's, a, here's another question. Does the ACA, do the ACA policies that are in the state marketplaces, do they cover dental insurance? It depends, right? Most of them do not. Um, child, uh, children's dental is almost always covered um, because that's an essential service under the ACA. Um, adult dental, um, many insurers do not cover that. Um, and you can buy a standalone dental plan through healthcare.gov um, or your state-based marketplace. Um, it, if you have uh, certain subsidies, I think part of your if you have leftover premium subsidies, let's say you got a bronze plan and your subsidies cover um, the whole thing and you've got some leftover, I, I believe you could push it over to your um, dental insurance. Um, but I, I wouldn't depend on that. But dental insurance often is not as expensive as, um, as health insurance. And, uh, you know, uh, what I usually tell people, um, and this is personal for me, what I usually tell people when I'm assisting them is that um, if you're thinking about getting a root canal or you're thinking about getting a major, um, a, a, a bunch of fillings or you know that there's a problem, um, dental insurance is really helpful, right? It, it's, a, it's almost like a discount plan. It really lowers your bill, right? So you want to sort of um, think to yourself, um, especially if you're trying to budget out and saying, okay, I only have so much money a month. What can I really spend it on? Um, you want to really budget out, okay, am I only going to get uh, one cleaning every six months and, and I generally have really good health and I'm not worried about it, um, then that's when you might just um, find a dentist that provides a discount rate for new patients or, or you can pay for that cleaning outright. Um, but if you are thinking about getting like a root canal or something where you know you need some work on your mouth and it's going to be expensive, then that's where dental insurance um, comes in handy to lower those prices. And it might be worth paying that, um, that $100 a year, or $200 a year, depending on um, depending on the insurance company to, to get that plan. Great. So here's a question from Facebook that deals with um, the sort of the caseload, if you will, of healthcare.gov and whether or not in light of how difficult it's been to get through for unemployment compensation or the SBA loans, is healthcare.gov experiencing any kind of big uptick in traffic right now? And what is the best way to get my application and questions answered? Sure. So um, the best way to get your um, application questions answered, I um, I would say is to try to find a, a local navigator or sister in your area. And that's through, um, you can go to um, Enroll America has different options for you. Find local help on healthcare.gov. And Tom, I can um, share some links um, if, if, if 
probably if you remind me after this, I can share I some links for you. I will. Um, uh, or if I take a look at these questions after as well. Um, you can find local help. Um, a lot of uh, navigators and assisters are ramping up um, their abilities to help people virtually um, through video or over the phone and can help you through the application and all of your questions, especially when it comes to some confusing income uh, questions as well. Um, other than that, when you apply through healthcare.gov or your state-based marketplace, it um, automatically determines your eligibility. They might have something called data matching issues, right? So um, if your income is significantly different than what they have on record um, from the IRS or from your uh, state tax files, then they might ask you to um, prove your income, right? And that's you upload some documents that are uh, approved by either your state marketplace or the federal marketplace to um, to sort of reconcile that data matching issue. But um, but typically, if, if you go through the application, it gives you an eligibility notice. So at the end of the marketplace application, it'll say you're eligible for X amount of dollars in premium tax credits per year, which is X amount of premium tax credits a month. And then, um, and then they'll say, okay, you can go ahead and pick your plan, right? And then you go through and you can um, pick the plan that you prefer. Um, and then it'll also say, okay, well, you know, we want you to prove your income, but for now, um, you have 90 days to prove that income and you can go ahead and pick your plan. So a lot of this is sort of automatically, um, automatic eligibility. Um, there are some states that when you apply, this is where um, it becomes important to know, um, to sort of do the work in figuring out whether or not you might be on uh, Medicaid eligibility or um, healthcare.gov. So there are um, any state um, through healthcare.gov or your state marketplace, you can apply, you can put your income in, and um, healthcare.gov is set up to sort of refer people to Medicaid if it, if it dings that, um, that you uh, might be eligible for the program. And that's where it becomes a little tricky. I mean, if you are a state that expanded Medicaid, some of them, like uh, Virginia, um, and certain states have automatic enrollment into Medicaid. If, if there's no, um, no issues, you know, it's very clear cut that you um, are eligible for Medicaid. In states like Virginia, healthcare.gov will say, okay, you're eligible for Medicaid and you've been enrolled. Wait for some more information from the Medicaid program. And then you're covered, you're good, and you can pick your Medicaid plan um, with your Medicaid agency. You'll get some information on that um, from your state. And then, um, but there are some, and state-based marketplaces are often um, similar to that. You can apply through um, your uh, marketplace website and it'll refer you directly into Medicaid if you're eligible. Um, the hiccup in this is states that have not expanded Medicaid or states that don't have um, automatic enrollment. Um, and there is some hiccups even with states that have automatic enrollment. Um, healthcare.gov, uh, Medicaid is, is a state and federal partnership, right? So each state has their own Medicaid agency, they have their own Medicaid offices, and they have their own Medicaid rules. So, um, so it makes it really difficult for um, healthcare.gov to always have a, a seamless, warm handoff with Medicaid. So, um, so in states that have not expanded Medicaid, if, if you know that, um, that you're under 100% right now, but you know that you'll be over 100% for the full year, then, um, then you wanna make sure to look at that slide where I talk about estimating your income and, um, and make sure that you're not putting zero for a month because you might get um, a, a, not a false eligibility, but they might refer you to Medicaid and that can sometimes take three months to get the denial from Medicaid and then get back for a special enrollment period on healthcare.gov. It's sort of, a, to skip that step. But, um, but assisters are always uh, eager and ready and willing to help. So uh, many states have um, different informational numbers and uh, hotlines and, um, and you, can, you can find um, some information as well on our navigator guide. Great, thank you. And now we're getting some questions from Twitter and from Facebook regarding the COVID-19 and health insurance and how sure. to it. So the big question is, will health insurance providers cover the cost of COVID-19 testing? in that, you know, in, in totality. Sure, so um, I believe, I, do, I don't wanna get this wrong, but um, I believe in the CARES Act and the Family First Act, um, or in one of those pieces of legislation, it, it, uh, COVID-19 testing is, is covered, but there are um, rules to it, right? Like uh, there's a shortage of testing tests right now, so, um, so not everyone, it, just because you wanna test doesn't mean that um, you'll be approved to get one, right? And that doesn't mean that the insurer won't cover it. It just means that you might not, it might not be available to you, right? So there are some hospitals that aren't testing people unless they're over 102 uh, fever and things like that, or you've been in contact with someone, you know, there's certain rules to getting the test, but um, they are covered. 
um, absolutely covered by your insurance. And many insurers have um, taken steps um, to provide more coverage to make sure that your treatment is covered um, for COVID-19, that they've expanded telehealth coverage, um, things like this that are often uh, sort of in your in the back seat of your head, but become really important um, during a pandemic, right? So um, many insurers have taken steps. The best way to know exactly what's covered for you is um, asking your insurer, saying, okay, what, you know, during coronavirus, what's covered for me? Many insurers have FAQs and fact sheets on, um, on steps they've taken during coronavirus, um, but the tests and treatment for coronavirus are covered under those pieces of legislation. So does that make them totally free if they're covered? So there are some loopholes, right? There's, you know, this is, um, you know, <laughs> the real, um, maybe the model for America is a loophole, but um, so in the legislation, it, the treatment's covered, right? But that doesn't mean you are not um, subject to that uh, balanced bill, right? So if you're in the hospital and you're being taken care of, the treatment for COVID-19 is covered, but that doesn't mean that the physician assistant or the, you know, certain um, medical assistants and other people, if you're on a, um, if you have to get IVs or you have to get certain things that there are providers in and out of the hospital that aren't necessarily in the insurance network um, that the hospital is in. So you might still be subject to this out of network bill, right? By some provider that has touched you in some way um, during your stay at the hospital, right? So they're, um, so the really the best way to know is to go through your insurer to find out exactly what is covered in these situations. Okay, here's a question from Facebook. Are there any coverages right now that one could be looking at adding when the applying for new coverage, whether under an open window or in November when the next eligibility period starts, given COVID-19 since it's going to likely be a threat to us for many months to come? Sure, yeah. So I think the first step is um, looking at that map. If you're in a state that expanded Medicaid and right now your income has either completely depleted month on a monthly basis. This doesn't mean that you won't go back to work and you won't be able to get employer coverage again or whatever coverage you um, wanted before. But um, Medicaid insurance is comprehensive. It's a lot of times premium free. Um, they cover your primary care visits, specialists, prescriptions, things like this. So, um, and some of them in, in Maryland, the Medicaid program, most Medicaid insurers cover dental as well, adult dental. So if you're, if you're in between zero and 138 at the federal poverty level on a monthly basis um, in those states that have expanded Medicaid, that's, I can't stress it enough, first step, go there, apply to Medicaid. Um, that's a really good safety net for people right now. Um, if you're um, in a state that has not expanded Medicaid, first step is to try to see if, uh, if you're eligible for a special enrollment period. There are those state-based market marketplaces that um, have those special enrollment periods just for coronavirus. And then um, for people who have lost their jobs, you have 60 days since you've lost your job to um, to enroll in a marketplace plan, uh, even in states that haven't um, made their own special special enrollment period for coronavirus. Um, so um, those are your first two steps for people who are sort of in this gap where you're in a state that has not expanded Medicaid, you're using the healthcare.gov platform and perhaps you were just uninsured before that or you had an expensive off marketplace plan that is no longer seemingly affordable. Um, you can uh, work with your insurer um, and see if there's some sort of plan. Um, if you're on this expensive off marketplace plan, you can work with your insurer and see if there's a, a grace period or, uh, or some sort of way. Uh, a lot of companies are sort of giving uh, extended grace periods for payment or, you know, sort of uh, pushing payments uh, to later on when people might have a little bit more uh, money. Um, otherwise, um, you know, there, there are these plans, the alternative coverage plans, um, shorter plans, things like that. And that, and that could cover, um, you know, in hospital only plans and stuff like that. If there's a big emergency, um, then at least you have some coverage, right? Um, and that's important, but it's really also important to know, um, the, the regulations of those and that they are not medic, they're not, um, they're supplementary. Um, I think and and should not um be instead of insurance if you can get insurance real aca comprehensive insurance that should absolutely be the priority over um over getting one of these um alternative coverage plans but um but make sure you talk to a reputable broker um it's it's best to go to sort of like a 
I would encourage people to reach out to brokers that are local and not always go to those online brokers because, you know, um, I, I like to think that if, uh, if there's a, a chance that I can run into you at the grocery store, I'm not going to um, pull the wool over your eyes when I try to sell you something, right? So I think it's really good to go to those reputable local brokers when you're thinking about go getting um, any sort of alternative health coverage. Great. And so from Twitter, under the ACA, my insurance premium subsidy is dependent on adjusted gross income, AGI. But for self a self-employed person, AGI is dependent on the insurance premium, since premiums are deductible for the self-employed. So I'm not sure exactly where the question is in that, uh, but it says um, self-employed, is it better for me to buy health insurance through a broker or through the exchange? Sure. So self-employed, um that definitely you can buy insurance through the exchange and um and your insurance you can sort of um deduct from your taxes later on right so um it's uh it's a modified adjusted uh gross income right so um not exactly your agi but there's modifications so um in that you can sort of when you say i'm self and i'm self-employed and you're going through the application with your income um there is a way to sort of take out um your health insurance expenses. Um, I wanna make sure I get that right. So if there's a way that I could take that question and, and email whoever's interested or, or Tom give you the, um, a better, more comprehensive answer to that um, to make sure I get the right calculations in there for um, the modified adjusted gross income um, for self-employed. Um, but also for self-employed people, there are certain um, states like i said in the presentation virginia as well as um some insurers like insurers like some blue cross plans in texas or a blue cross plan in iowa or um or something that offers small group coverage um a small employer coverage um some of them allow sole proprietors some of them allow small employers to um to um that have only one employee yourself um, to enroll in a small group plan that often have um, smaller premiums and individual markets. So um, for that, I would go to your um, Department of Insurance or find a reputable, a reputable local broker who um, who's approved in um, small group coverage. And um, there's a database. I, I don't want to get the website wrong. So Tom, I can I can get back to that and sort of give you um, a link where people can search brokers that are um, accredited. Um, and registered, and then they can sort of uh, get emails and phone numbers and um, reach out to someone that's, um, you know, a person in your neighborhood or in your state that um, that can answer questions about sole proprietors and um, enrolling in small group coverage. But because um, health, healthcare.gov um, really only does individual market other than the shop program. Okay, and here's another question How is vision care covered under the Affordable Care Act? Uh, you know, marketplace sure. insurance plans. Sure. So um, it's, it's, I always think it's very um, not funny, but I'm laughing um, that, um, you know, we talk about health, we talk about health insurance, but oftentimes we forget um, the things that are closest to us, our teeth and our eyes. So um, a lot of health insurance plans, um, eye insurance is typically separate. If you think about buying insurance through your um, employer, you often get your health insurance plan, then you have an option to enroll also in um, an eye, an eye insurance plan and a um, dental insurance plan. So um, there's no across the board rule for um, covering eye exams or anything like that, but um, many health insurers will cover um, perhaps uh, one eye exam or give you um, some sort of thing. So you would have to look in your summary of benefits and coverage. Um, when, and you could see those on healthcare.gov. They all have summaries of benefits and coverage before you enroll, right? So you can sort of compare your plans and see um, which one offers you um, some sort of leeway on that. But um, but eye insurance as well, sorry, excuse me, is uh, similar in, in that vein to, to dental insurance as I was talking to before. If you just need an eye exam um, and you're usually pretty good, you know, there's uh, nothing you need totally. Um, then perhaps you can uh, pay out of pocket for the eye exam. But if you're someone who um, who has more issues than, with your eyes than that, or, or you need contacts or something like that, then it might be um, a good idea to look at standalone insurers for, for eye insurance. Great. This has been fantastic, Olivia, and I really appreciate very much your time with us today. You've been very, very helpful to all those who've been attending. And I think that, you know, I know that, People who weren't able to attend today's webinar will 
benefit from seeing it online. And so if you wanted to send me that additional information that we've discussed, I will be happy to yeah. make sure that that gets posted in the in association with the video. Yeah, and absolutely. And feel free to have my email on there, my Twitter. Fantastic. Um, if anyone has any questions, feel free to reach out. I will answer as best as I can, as quickly as I can, um, and try to refer you to the right um, the right people. Well, I really appreciate this, Olivia, and you've been very generous with your time today. So thank you for thank that. Thank you, Tom. And thanks, everyone who's watching. I really appreciate it. And I want to remind everyone that we are doing a town hall on Friday at 3 p.m. And registration for that is on the is in the chat box, and it's also uh, available, obviously, on our website. And I would encourage you to let your friends and uh, colleagues who may not be members of ASMP, but who certainly have an interest in everything that we're doing to respond to the COVID-19 pandemic, to join us on Friday at 3 p.m. Eastern. We'll continue the conversation. I've been in back and forth with uh, my colleagues inside the organization and leadership and our general counsel to uh, get uh, you know get a, additional information readied up for the next web town hall. So please uh, plan to join us if you can. And as with this webinar and all the webinars that we're doing and all the town halls, we record them and then place them on the website afterwards. So you will be able to uh, access the information that's being provided if you haven't you know haven't been able to attend one or the other in person. So again, Olivia, thank you very much. And thanks everyone for attending. Uh, we'll see you on the town hall on Friday. Thank you. See ya. Bye.